the last couple of years has gotten us thinking about the end of the age, maybe like we haven't since 9-11. Now, that's just my opinion. But, you know, 9-11, a lot of people were thinking about, whoa, is this the end? And I, and I can tell you, it was the Gulf War before, the first Gulf War. And um, I was living at that time, Rebecca and myself were living out in California in Vista, which is right next to Camp Pendleton. And um, man, the church filled up. On staff, we had calls coming in all day long. Is this the Battle of Armageddon? No, we knew it wasn't. But my response to this, well, I don't know. You might want to come to church and get things right. It could be. <laughs> it could be. I'm just saying, you, might, you want to get it right with the Lord. So um, we were encouraging people to get right. But there are certain events that happen in a country or in a culture that causes us to think, could this be the return of the Lord? And so you had the Gulf War, you had 9-11, um, all the things that we've gone through the last couple of years with a, you know, a raucous election, with a cultural upheaval, a pandemic, has caused people to really begin to look, and, and I'm glad for that. I think we should be um, looking and considering, Lord, is this, is this you know, the time? But we can come to a place where we begin to attach a prophetic significance to every single event. And then when it does not come to pass, the return of the Lord gets discredited. The rapture of the church begins to, to wane in its significance. And people feel disappointed and like, well, I don't know if I want to even look at this stuff anymore because they always get disappointed. But here's what has not disappointed you. The Lord. Prophecy teachers maybe have disappointed you. The website, the blog might have disappointed you. Your own thoughts and conclusions might have disappointed you. But the word of God has not disappointed you. And so it still stands that there is a rapture for the church and there is a second coming of Christ and there are end times events that are going to take place. So what I'd like to discuss with you in this study is, is three main things. I want to talk to you about this idea of imminency. I want to talk to you from Matthew 24, comparing that with Revelation um, 6. And what is a birth pang? Have you, how many of you have heard that phrase before, a birth pang? Okay, so in Matthew 24, we're going to come into that. That essentially is the signs that relate to the soon return of the Lord, second coming of the Lord to be specific. And then lastly, um, we're going to talk about the difference between an event being a sign or a possibility. And it's the possibilities where we've been disappointed. And we'll talk about a list of them. I'm going to make sure I try and offend every single one of you on that list <laughs> because I want to be fair. I want to be equitable. And um, if you're not offended, I'll feel like I somehow disappointed you. So um, we'll, we'll take a look at the very end. Um, you can just relax. That's when I'm going to offend you. Um, won't be to the end. But let's start talking, first of all, about this idea of the imminent return of Christ. The imminent return of Christ. The doctrine of imminence is a cornerstone teaching to the pre-tribulation view. If... A consistent literal interpretation is a cornerstone to understanding the, the, there will be a, a, a literal reign of Christ upon the earth, the premillennial view. Well, that's what the doctrine of imminence is to the pre-trib rapture. And so what is this doctrine of imminence? Of course, imminent. I mean, we all understand that word. Ready to take place. Or impending, that's how we would generally think of that word. So generally used in theology for the view that the rapture can occur at any time. Here, listen to this. No prophecy remains to be fulfilled before the rapture. This is a view that is connected with the pre-tribulation uh, rapture. We sang about it. It might be today. I look into your eyes. That's because we believe in the doctrine of imminence, that the Lord could come back today. Any moment, Jesus could be on the scene for his church. Another really important thought to keep in mind here is the rapture, the pre-trib rapture of the church is a signless event. It's a signless event. You don't, when we look and say, oh, look what's happening. Jesus is about to come back and rapture the church. Be careful. Because we don't believe anything has to be fulfilled in order for the Lord to return. And it's been that way for 2,000 years. So it's a signless event. 
And, um, and yet we can see prophetic fulfillment that relates to the second coming, but never to the rapture because we, can, we believe it can happen at any moment. And I want to go through a list of verses with you. Um, some of them I'm just going to read to you, and you can just draw the, your own significance out of that. that. Some of them will we'll spend a little more time. The first one, though, is Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There was this mentality in the early church that expected Jesus to come at any moment. Uh, Philippians 4, 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. <laughs> the idea is, the Lord's coming back. Don't be found being harsh with people. Like, I don't understand. Well, you remember when you were a kid and you thought you heard your mom and dad's car pull up and you maybe were in the house doing something you weren't supposed to or you knew it was about time? It was at hand. I can still remember getting a can of right guard and, um, and matches. And um, doing stuff with it in the backyard. And there's no kids in here, sir, so don't, don't, don't do this. But, yeah, so I told you I was a troublemaker. And so I remember being in the backyard just seeing what I could do with that. But I also knew mom and dad were at hand. So I was always running into the front yard, checking out, running in the backyard, and going through that can of right guard and making flames. So this is the idea. Be gentle with all people. Don't be found being harsh because the Lord is at hand. He's about to open the door. And what are you going to be found doing when he opens the door? 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So there's this idea that, again, we are waiting, we are looking, eagerly expecting the return of of Jesus. Now I want you to turn with me to this passage. It's a little longer, and we did look at it last night, but I want to come back to it again. It's 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. And in this passage, I'm just going to set it up for you and then read it. This was a church that had been taught about prophecy, and they had questions about these things. But then they it had people that began to die, physically die in the church. And they made the conclusion, oh, they died. And they missed out. I mean, Jesus was about to come back and is going to take us to be with them, but they died. And what happens to, did they, are they going to miss out on the resurrection now? So 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's the New Testament way of saying a believer has died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, there's that rapture word, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another that even though somebody had died before the rapture, they're going to be first in line, and then we're going to meet them in the air with the Lord. The point is this. They believe that the return of Jesus, I actually used a different phrase. They believe that the rapture, the catching up, was going to happen so quickly, so soon, they didn't even expect that anybody in the church would die. Do you see that? This is why they're like freaked out. Oh, no, they've died. He said, no, 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 it's, it's okay. I don't want you to start about this. It's all right. Because what's going to happen is there's going to be a rapture, and those that are asleep in Jesus, they're going to be in the air first with him, and then we're going to come along right behind them. So you don't need to worry about that. They have not missed out. So they were, dis they were troubled. Of course, we saw in 2 Thessalonians last night, they were troubled that they were in the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians, they're troubled that those brothers and sisters in Christ who have died before experiencing the rapture have missed out. 
You only can have that concept if you expect the Lord to be returning at any moment. You don't have that fear otherwise. If you think, oh, well, you know, it's going to be a long time. It's going to see an antichrist. We're going to see the two witnesses, uh, demons out of the pit, um, you know, hailstones, uh, volcanoes, earthquakes. Um, yeah, they died, but you know a lot of us are going to die when the day of the Lord comes. But they didn't have that concept. They believed they would not be of the day and that the rapture was coming so quickly that they were surprised that anybody would even die. So this tells you of the imminence, the imminent expectation they had of the rapture of the church. Let's move on. Titus chapter 2, verse 13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Man, this is an awesome verse. There's so much in this verse, so much theology in this verse. But look for. You should be looking for the return of the Lord. Because he can come back at any moment. Again, if they expected him to come back, uh, you know, synonymous with the second coming at the end of the tribulation, then they could expect a lot of other things to happen. And I'm, we're going to read here in just a moment. You can even know how many days it'll be until the return of the Lord. You can know how many days. And I'll show you this from Scripture. So again, uh, let me read to you uh, what, a, what Dr. Walverd says. And uh, Tyler has some of the, his commentaries out on the table there. Um, he says, the exhortation, the one found in Titus 2.13, the exhortation to look for the glorious appearing of Christ to his own loses its significance if the tribulation must intervene first. Believers in that case should look for signs, which means this. The believer should not be looking for signs for the rapture, but for the second coming. Because if I'm looking for a sign for the rapture, then that sign has to happen be, before the rapture can take place. This is the whole problem with date setting. You know, so do you believe in the imminent return of Jesus? Yes. And you believe he's going to come when? Well, on this date. Well, then it's not imminent. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to get into the month, and then you got to get into the week, and then you got to get into the day for that to happen. It's not imminent until the day comes. So, again, signs are for the second coming. Signs are not for the rapture. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. I'm just trying to show you how many places in the New Testament speak of this idea of the soon return of the Lord. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. His hand is on the door. And you will give an account when we pass through that, when he comes through that door. One more passage. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11 Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one take away your crown. So the New Testament writers exhorted and taught believers to live with an expectancy of Jesus' rapture, well, coming for the church in our rapture. There was no other prophetic event that needed to take place. Well, didn't Israel have to come back into the land? Israel did not have to come back into the land. It does for the second coming, but not for the rapture. Now, they are back in the land, and I think that is a significant prophetic fulfillment for the second coming. But, you know, but if you, let's say Israel is not in the land, just for those of you that are maybe are thinking about and just trying to work out the idea. Of, he said, signs for the second coming, but none for the rapture. All right, let's say that Israel is not back in the land, and yet we know they must be back in the land because Jesus is going to come and rescue them in the land at the second coming. So let's say they're not in the land, and the rapture happens today. Then you know what? I think you could expect in a matter of days that the land of Israel will be flooded with Jews returning. Um, how long did it take for millions of people to leave Ukraine? See what I'm saying? So these things, although we see fulfillments of the second coming, the things can unfold quickly. And so we are not looking for any signs to be fulfilled for the rapture. So the pre-trib position is the only view of the tribulation and the rapture of the church that can expect Jesus to return at any moment. 
Let me say that again. The pre-tribulational position is the only position that can expect that Jesus can return at any moment. If you are a mid-trib person, you believe he's going to come in the middle of the tribulation, then you're awaiting for um, chapter 6, the seals of, Revel of Revelation. We'll talk about them in a moment to begin to take place. You should expect to see a treaty signed in Israel between the Antichrist and Israel. You should expect that to happen. You should expect to see some things unfold. If you're post-trib, well, then you should be wait for the abomination of desolation. Look, wait for the two witnesses, those guys that they can't kill. That they're, they're turning water into blood. They're, 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 they're stopping up the heavens and it won't rain. People are trying to kill them and they're bulletproof. Watch for those two guys. Because until you see those two guys, and I believe they're in the first half of the tribulation, you're not going to see Jesus. After those guys, you're going to have the Antichrist. After that, you're going to have the, the trumpets and the bull judgments. Read through Revelation 6 through 19. And then the second coming of Christ. So only the pre-trib position. Just as the pre-mill position is the one that believes in a consistent literal interpretation of prophecy, specifically for the nation of Israel. And the other views do not. And so it is with the pre-trib we believe that he can come back at any moment, and it's the only position that has that. Um, let me give you an example. The second coming of the Lord is a much documented event in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, and it's full of signs and it even gives time frames. Even gives time frames. I'll give you an example. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. We've been talking about the two witnesses. And we read here, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. How long is 1,260 days? It is three and a half years. It's half of the tribulation. And if you remember last time, I said, I believe what's going to happen is the Antichrist is going to kill these guys, and he's going to have worldwide equity. Everybody's like, finally, this guy, who is this guy? He can take out the two witnesses. Oh, he must be somebody, and then he will go full of himself from the streets of Jerusalem up into the Temple Mount, where the temple will have been rebuilt, and he'll say, you worship me now. And that will be what is called, what is that event called? Abomination. Abomination of desolation. Now let's read from that point forward. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, Then the woman fled into the wilderness. Why? Because the Antichrist is saying, you'll worship me. Then the woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there for how long? 1,260 days. What happens after 1,260 days? They don't need the help of people any longer, because the Lord himself will be back. So you can count days you can count days when the tribulation begins. It's a seven-year period. It's broken down into 1,260 days, two segments. It's broken down into three and a half uh, years, three and a half years, or some prophets will refer to it as a time, times, and half a time. Time one year, times, you know, would be, you know, bring you to three years. Half a time would be half a year, three and a half years. So this is a much documented event that's going to take place. Israel should know. The world should know when the events of the Great Tribulation. Now, you know what? I can almost feel the... It's like, wait a minute, but we're not supposed to know the day or the hour. Well, we don't know when, right, the rapture is going to happen. We don't know. It could happen now. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen in 10 years. It can happen in 50 years. It could happen in 500 years. You're like, no, it can't. Well, I mean, it can. None of us expect that it will, but it can we don't know how long the Lord is going to be patient, do we? He's waiting for people to be saved, and he loves people a whole lot. So he's waiting. And when he, the number has come into its fullness, then he'll say, all right, let's, let's get this last seven-year period underway. So some of the benefits of this doctrine, the doctrine of imminency, is it creates a sense of urgency to live holy and be found faithful at the Lord's return because... His hand is on the door, right? He's ready to walk through. And so it creates a sense of urgency. We're not looking for signs and prophetic events to be fulfilled. We are just knowing that it might be today. 
It might be today. It also eliminates the possibility of date setting. If you, if you hold to this in its proper way, in the imminent return, you're not going to set a date. It makes no sense. I believe in the imminent return of the Lord. He's not coming back for at least six months. Well, that's not imminent. Okay? So w- when you have this as a doctrine, you don't walk this out. One other passage that kind of, I think, is a fun one to look at. I saved it for last as it relates to the doctrine of imminence. Is in found in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. Does anybody know what those three words? It's those three words, actually. It's one Aramaic word. Does anybody know what that word is? Maranatha. So this is where that, you've heard that word, right? So here it is. This is where it comes from. O Lord, come. And, and if you put up that next slide, Maranatha consists of three Aramaic words. Mar, Lord, Anna, our, and Tha, come, meaning our Lord, come. They coined a phrase to talk about the return of the Lord. So when they, when they were um, uh, greeting one another, or they were saying goodbye, um, what they say is, our Lord comes. It was a way to just get it in the mind, in the heart, in the ears of one another. Be looking. Our Lord is coming for us. What a beautiful way to say goodbye to each other, don't you think? I think the, I think the modern day church could really benefit by redeploying this greeting or this see you later. Rather, Hey, see you tomorrow. Instead of saying see you tomorrow, they said, our Lord comes. I might see you in the air. You know, so this is how they communicated. And, and it just tells you the expectancy that they had of the Lord's return. So that is the doctrine of eminence. And it, it helps us to make certain and, and, and determine what constitutes a sign or what a sign is for. And a sign is for the second coming. It's not for the rapture because our Lord comes. It might be today. He's, he's standing at the door. He's, you know, his hand is right there on the door handle. Don't, don't give up now. And so it gives such encouragement. Well, I want to move into the next phase of, of, of this teaching, and that is to actually look at the signs. Um, and in the Olivet Discourse, um, we're going to read here, and we're going to see the signs that Jesus gave, and we're going to make a comparison to Revelation chapter 6 as well. So at, at this point, again, some of you might be feeling, wait a minute, I, I'm... But there are signs. I know there are signs. I've read them somewhere that there are signs. There absolutely is signs. But it's not for the rapture. It is for the second coming of Christ. Because if there are signs, if you put the rapture at the end, again, you are waiting. You don't have to, you don't have to get all uptight until you see the Antichrist come. Of course, how long are you going to live? That's an issue to be concerned about. You don't know about that. But I mean, if you have a post-trib view, hey, Abomination and desolation, I'll put a little app on my phone, start cutting down from, you know, 1,260 days, and I'll, I'll know when Jesus is going to come. And, and, but that relates to the second coming, not the rapture. So let's turn to Matthew 24. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. Um, you might want to actually put a marker on Matthew 24. And then you also might want to put a marker there in Revelation chapter 6, because you're going to probably want to be flipping back and forth between these two. Let me read these verses to you. Now, as they sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things uh, will be. And what will be the sign of your coming? So there are signs in the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. The, uh, the sorrows here is the birth pain. It's, some of your translations will have birth pain, but it's, it's uh, those pangs that are associated with a woman that is about to give birth. And when those begin to happen, you know that it's not long before that child will be born. So these signs, when you see these signs, you can know 
that the end is about to come. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. When that child decides it's come, the body decides it's time for this child to come, you, you, it's coming, ready or not. Um, he or she is going to come. So this is an important passage for us to consider. Um, now some of you may think, well, but, the, but, but Paul wrote, and we read it last night to the Thessalonians, and he says, you have no re, uh, need for me to write to you concerning um, times and seasons. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.1. And he says, you know, for you know perfectly well. And he goes on. And so we, we hear that, but, and we stop reading. But he says, you know the times and seasons. really well. He's, well, he's talking to the church. The church knows the times and the seasons. Isn't that relating to the rapture? No, because if you remember, as you read through that passage, it's talking about the day of the Lord. It's talking about the events of the tribulation and the events of the second coming. And we can look and identify those specific signs. So we've got a whole list of things. Now, uh, the question here is when do we expect these birth pangs, these sorrows, to actually happen? When are they going to happen? Um, and so there are different views among those that have a pre-trib, pre-mill view. So Lewis Sperry Schaefer, some of you will know that name. He holds that Matthew 24, 4 through 8, describe the events of the present church age. So in other words, when he says, yeah, but the end is not yet, he is describing that this is what's going to be going on before the Lord returns. There's going to be these earthquakes, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be famine. It's just a general course of events that are going to take place. Um, another author, C.I. Schofield, heard of the Schofield Bible? Um, he believes that Matthew 24, uh, 4 through 14, has a double fulfillment of the church age and the tribulation. So he agrees with um, Lewis Schaefer that it refers to the church age, but he says, I also think this is going to have a double meaning at the end of the age. Um, another author, Schuyler English, believes that Matthew 24, 4 through 14 is the first half of the tribulation. The first half of the tribulation. Um, and then another author, he believes and agrees with that, 24 through, uh, uh, verses 4 through 8 is the first half of the tribulation, and he also thinks that it correlates with Revelation chapter 6. Remember the writers? You have the red horse, you have the pale horse, you have the you know, black horse. We'll look at it in just a moment. And he believes that these birth pangs that are listed there, that they correspond with what is happening at the opening of the book of Revelation. So if you can put that chart up there, see, I, I realize if you're in the very back, you might not be able to see it real well. Um, but on the left side, we have Matthew 24, and got the references and just a summary of what's going on. So Matthew 24, 4 and 5, you have the false Christs. Verses 6 through the first part of 7, you have wars. Um, 24, the middle part of verse 7, you have famines. Um, at the end of verse 7, Matthew 24, you have pestilence. And 24, verse 9, um, and some other verses going on, you have um, persecution. And then again, back to verse 7, you have earthquakes. So the reason I put it out of order is to see how it relates with the writers of the book of Revelation. So I'm going to turn over to Revelation. You might want to turn there with me. And um, we'll read that. And you can keep looking at that chart and begin to um, see how they would correlate. I'm, I'm not being dogmatic on this, but I do believe that there is enough similarity that you at least need to be aware of it. You can make your own conclusion whether you think it's talking about the same events or not. I think it's highly likely that it is. Um, but this is a tough passage. Again, pre-trib, pre-mill, champions of these, uh, of, of these beliefs Lewis Berry Schaefer, Schofield, Schuyler English, uh, Walverd, Pentecost, they all can vary a little bit as to when they think these signs, these birth pangs are going to take place. I would agree with the latter ones, although I, there are different times I've had different views on this, but I believe that this is more referring to what's going to happen during the tribulation, not the intervening age. If it is a description of the church age, then it's not like, it's just saying this stuff's going to go on. And, of course, 
on that point. Have earthquakes happened since Jesus has been gone? Uh, yes. And has there been pestilence? Has there been famines? Have nations gone to fight against each other? Have been there, you know, been David Koresh's of the world that have deceived people? Uh, yeah, all those things have gone on. So it's just what's going to happen. But I do think that it does fit tightly um, with Revelation chapter 6. Therefore, the idea being that these birth pangs are relating to the first part of the tribulation. So let me read a little bit to you, beginning at verse 1. You can kind of keep your eye on the chart back and forth. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice, like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So he rides on the white horse. This is, we most believe this is the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ, um, that it, we're talking about. Jesus doesn't come to conquer, right? I mean, he, this is not what he's doing. He's not coming to destroy the world. He's definitely judging, but he's not coming um, to deceive in this way. Verse 3, get to the second seal. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So we have wars here. Verse 5, they come to the third seal. When he opened the third seal, um, uh, I heard the living creature say, Come and see, and look, behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, a day's wage, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So you got famine going on during the third seal, just like Matthew 24 7 says there will be famines. Verses 7 and 8. The fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him. And power is given uh, to, to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And so, you know, again, the idea this is being related to this one is pestilence. you got a few things wrapped up in, in this, this writer. Uh, the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. So now we're talking about the persecution. And then we move on down to uh, verse 12 where you have the sixth seal. And I looked when he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black. And he goes on to describe other cataclysmic, cataclysmic events going on in the earth. So... Earthquakes being part of it. Earthquakes are going to be out throughout the entire tribulation. But you can see how there is a lot of similarity between those birth pangs of Matthew chapter 24 and the six seals there in the book of Revelation. So then what's the conclusion? Well, then it's that the, it, these seals, actually these uh, birth pangs, are in the tribulation period. So when we see an earthquake, when we see pestilence, covid when we see events going on, um, these are things that are going to happen in the tribulation, but with great intensity. So when we look at this and say, well, that's a sign, it's a sign. Well, are you sure it's a sign? Because these are signs of what's going to happen in the tribulation. These things certainly have gone on. You can find any one of these things that have gone on in the last 2,000 years. But in the um, tribulation... It's birth pangs. It's not Braxton Hicks. Right? So we, if, for the last 2,000 years, if you will, there's been Braxton Hicks, right? Those, it's false birth pangs, right? It's just letting the lady know something's going to happen sooner or later. But it's, you, don't, you, know, you don't need to call your husband and say, come home, right? It's, oh, those are Braxton Hicks. So they, they fill those, 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 you know, the tightening, the cramps. And that's, that's going on. But it's not what's going on when you go into labor, when you go into labor, it's going to happen. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's going to grow in intensity. And it will not stop until the birth is completed. And, of course, the metaphor here is until the Lord has returned. So I think it's important for us to see this. So those are some of the signs that he talked about. Famines, pestilence, persecution, earthquakes, um, 
And they're going to be intense. And as you read through the book of Revelation, you see that these things are going on. The beginning of sorrows. So those are the birth pangs related to the tribulation. There are other signs of Christ's second coming that I want to talk to you about. And so um, the, the assignment Tyler gave was to talk about it being a sign or a possibility. And so let's talk about some of these signs. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says that in last days scoffers will come. And so scoffers have been around for a long time. But there's going to be in the, you know, in the last days, there's going to be intense uh, mocking that takes place. So we can look at that and we can say, well, we can expect that this is going to grow. And so as you see the scoffing, it may not be a sign of it during the tribulation, but you're just like, you know, this is the kind of thing that is going to happen. Or Daniel chapter 9, an important verse, tells us that Israel is really where our attention needs to be focused when we're thinking about the signs of the second coming of Christ. Daniel chapter 9, verses 23 through 24. It's the, the tent. I guess you got wind out there. Alerts and tents blowing around. That's, this is an exciting church. I love it. Yeah, it's a sign. Yeah, there it is. Yep. It's a sign you need to turn your phone off, silence it. It's a sign that you got to put weights down for the tent. But uh, let's, let's talk about this idea of Israel being the prophetic time clock. Daniel chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Um, is, is typically where you look to when this point is made. Now he's going to refer to 70 weeks. And I'm not going to take the time to go into it. I'm just going to tell you, and you can just take my you know, encouragement to go study it for your own. But it represents 490 years. Okay, So as we read that, you can know. At the beginning of your supplications, Daniel, the command went out, and I have come to tell you that you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks, 490 years, are determined for your people and for your holy city. Who are the people of Daniel? It's Israel, Hebrews, Jews. And what is the holy city of the Jews? It's Jerusalem. So 490 years are determined for your people, for the holy city. And this is what's going to happen. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, boy, that has not happened yet, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So vision and prophecy is not sealed up yet. I mean, there, it's still being fulfilled. So there's 490 years. And we know that 483 years of that clock have been fulfilled. From the time it was told in Nehemiah 2 to rebuild Jerusalem because it had been destroyed by the Babylon, Babylonians until Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, that was 483 years. It mean, means there's seven years left on that clock. Why did the clock stop ticking? Because Israel rejected Jesus. And the prophecy is not for the church. The prophecy is for Israel. And so he says, now these things are hidden from your eyes. But when you call upon me in the end, then I'll come and I will rescue you. So we want to look at Israel, and we want to pay attention to what's going on with her. So turn with me over to um, the Old Testament. Let's turn to Ezekiel 38. And here is a sign of the last days, something that we can expect will take place. Um, I believe that it has taken place, um, and it's significant to the second coming of the Lord. So in Ezekiel 38, um, and, and I'll read, let's just pick up at, at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog in the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So these other nations. And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, 
all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling the swords. And they actually names nations that we're familiar with, Persia or Iran, Ethiopia and Libya are with them, all of them with the shield and the helmet. Gomer and all his troops, the house of Tagrama, Turkey, from the far north and all his troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about and be a guard for them. So they're about to come and attack Israel. And so we're, God's speaking to those coalition of nations. Verse 8. After many days you will be visited, and the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So he speaks of how in the latter days, look at verse 8, in the latter days that Israel would come back into her land on the mountains and it had long been desolate, and that they would come from, uh, a sword would drive them. So in 1948, Israel came back into their land, and the sword that drove them was a thing called the Holocaust. World War II, Hitler's final solution, right, to just wipe out all the Jews. And the world was shocked when it all came out. They, you know, when it was found out what took place, they said, listen, you can, you can go back to your land, We're, you know, whatever, you've gone through a lot. So they came back into land in 1948, and now we know it is a prosperous nation um, that exists today, the nation of Israel. But it says that they would come back in the latter years. And this was a land that had long been desolate. From 70 A.D. until 1948, Israel was out of their land. And now they've come back and they are dwelling safely in their land. Just like the prophet Ezekiel said. And so this is a, a prophecy that relates to the day of the Lord. This is a prophecy that relates to Israel. And they need to be in the land so the Lord can rescue them. So how do we deal with this? So it's a sign of them being back in the land of the second coming. And we look at that, we place significance on it, and we should, but how is that not a sign for the rapture? Well, again, let's say they are not in the land and we are raptured today in the next week or two, there's a flood of people that come. That, that's one way. But think about it this way. Um, how do you know, other than looking at the calendar, how do you know that Thanksgiving is about to come? Christmas decorations, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like you're at the store. It's like, oh, you know, look at all the Christmas decorations. Thanksgiving must be near. <laughs> so when we look at the signs of the second coming that relate to the nation of Israel, we look at those signs being fulfilled and we're like, ah, the rapture is getting close. Because if those events are lining up and being fulfilled prophetically for the second coming, and we believe the church is going to be gone first, it's like we are getting closer. So we need to put a, a proper emphasis upon these things. So th that's one of them. Um, you could go to Revelation chapter 13, where you see a one world government. Also there in Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, that the Antichrist is going to control all commerce. And so we can look and... And nothing has happened that has fulfilled these. But you can look and say, boy, people are sure interested in global government now. Or, you know, people are sure interested in that, you know, a reset. You know, this is the kind of the latest word that's been used a lot. Does that mean that this is Revelation 13? Nobody knows that. Nobody knows. It's not it right now. Could those thoughts and ideas one day lead to a one world government? Could it one day lead to the, the mark of the beast, you know, the chips and, and all the rest planted under your skin that can track and can have, you know, downloads and uploads, of, you know, of information. It, it could be. It could be. But maybe not. We don't know. So we must be careful as we look at the events that are going on politically and culturally and say, this is the, a sign that the rapture of the church is about to come. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. There are now 10 nations that are part of the European Union. That's significant. I mean, the rapture is about to happen. And then it goes to 12. And the European nation continues to grow. And it's like, oh, maybe it wasn't significant. Well, the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 
the rapture is about to happen. And then, well, it's like, what do you mean the fall? I mean, we don't even relate to that. How about, I said the Gulf War. We had people calling all the time. Here's one of my favorites. Y2K. Mm, yeah, we all laugh. But we weren't laughing, you know, you know, a couple of weeks ahead of time. I mean, there, there are people that were storing up beans and rice and water and buying generators. You know, the, all the hardware stores that they had a record amount of generators coming back to be returned. <laughs> you know, January 1st, 2001 or 2000. Because, you know, oh, well, the power didn't turn off, right? The, the grids didn't go down. The computers didn't fail. But everybody's like, this is it. That's the Tower of Babel all over. I mean, Jesus is going to come back any second because Y2K. People were by their generators, ready to go. And the ball dropped and nothing happened. And the wife was standing there with her hands on her hips going, you wasted so much of our money. You can stay in the shed with your generator, beans, and rice. I'll see you in a decade, okay? I mean... So everybody got up in arms about Y2K. I mean, there was even churches that decided to call themselves the Y2K church. That's, that's, that's embarrassing. It's 2002 and we're still here. Katrina was, a, 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 you know, a, a sign. 9-11, blood moons. And here we are. And the latest is COVID-19 vaccine. That's it. That is, I told you I was going to offend every one of you. That's it. It's, it's the mark of the beast. Let me tell you, in order to have a mark of the beast, you need a beast. beast. Where is he? Where is he? Oh, he is not on the scene? Then it's not a mark of the beast. Do you know what? When somebody takes the mark of the beast, do you know what they are doing when they take the mark of the beast? They're saying, I worship you as God. That's not why people are getting the COVID-19 vaccine. And so we have all of these things. And what ends up happening is people will sit back and say, uh, 10 nations, Berlin Wall, Gulf War, Y2K, Katrina, 9-11, blood moons, now COVID-19. You guys are all messed up. I don't, have any, I don't believe anything you have to say about the return of Jesus because you're wrong like all the time. And so we place an emphasis on things that we shouldn't. You know, historically, the Reformation, the establishing of America, the fall of Rome, the rise of Hitler, all of these e events historically were all signs that it's all about to happen. And in some of these cases, I mean, you know, we're a thousand years away, 1,500 years away from those events. But one day, a set of events will fall into place, and those seven years are going to begin. So we need to be careful. We need to exercise restraint and, and look at those significant signs. We gave you a list of them. Nation of Israel, you know, Antichrist and controlling. Those are things that are, are significant. We should be looking for the return of the Lord for his church. It is a signless event that can happen at any moment. Meanwhile, if we see the decorations for Christmas, we know that it only means that you know, Thanksgiving, the rapture of the church, is getting even closer. So we don't like say it's insignificant. We've got, we have these things, but not for the rapture. And I think we should exercise so much more restraint on these topics. I mean, have you noticed? I believe in the pre-trib, pre-mill uh, eschatology. But I also think that the church has done maybe too good of a job on prophecy updates and not a good enough job on teaching prophetic passages. Prophetic pass. Get into the Bible and study those passages. If, if, listen, I know I'll probably get an email from somebody who watches this online. There's not enough information to do a prophecy update every day, okay? <laughs> There's not enough information. And if you are, why don't you do a review of everything you said last year and see how much of it really turned out to be meaningful and significant? Well, I just want people to be ready. I do too, but please understand what is happening as you are discouraging the heart and mind of the church because they're like, well, you said that the blood moons were a thing. I sold everything I had and I took my RV out to the, to the desert. Now what? I don't know. You're going to have to go get a new loan and sell your RV, I guess. 
So these are the types of things that cause people just to say, forget it. I don't want anything to do with prophecy. But if we will restrain ourselves to what Scripture says and study the passages themselves, we will do fine. We'll have a proper expectation of the soon return of uh, the Lord for the church. And we can also be observing those prophecies that speak of what's going to happen before the second coming. And the emphasis we place is, well, we know an event happens first, the rapture, but if these things are lining up for the second coming, then great. Another illustration may be, you know, the curtain. And before the curtain opens, the second coming, there's all kinds of things that are going on behind the stage, right? And if we get a view of the things that are going on behind the stage, even though the curtain hasn't opened, you know it's about to open. And that is another good way to kind of look at these. But, um, yeah. The Lord's going to come back. We should be ready for Him. He's standing at the door, and it might be today. Father.